Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jack from JCB Short Films. And it's Josh, and you're listening to episode 78. Let's roll it. Hi, this is Daniel Goodman. Dylan Wang from JPerm. Ian Scheffler. Shua Munter from India. This is Alex from Z3 Cubing. What's up, guys? This is Jaden McNeil from Australia, and you're listening to the Corner Cutter Podcast. That's right. Welcome to the Corner Cutter Podcast. Podcasting since 2014 and cubing since 2015. I'm your host, Josh, and this is the most consistent speed cubing podcast dedicated to entertain and educate you with in-depth conversations with cubers from all across the sport. My website is the Corner Cutter Podcast. Dot com And thank you so much for joining me today for episode 78. And today is a Cuba Chats episode, so we'll jump right into that in a second. But if you have any feedback, please email in josh at thecornercutterpodcast.com. And if you're listening on YouTube, just leave a comment right down there below this video in quotes <laughs> and yeah it might be read on one of the upcoming episodes so let's jump into kubu chats okay we're back with another kubu chats episode jack welcome back hey thanks Josh, for having me i'm glad to be on so you were featured back in episode 32. We discussed how to be a successful YouTuber. It was an awesome show. And now you're hopefully going to be appearing on the, from now on, the, some of the um, Kubu Chats episodes. So t- today we're discussing when to learn full OLL and PLL, as well as is it worth it to buy flagship cubes? And this that's going to be an interesting topic. I'm excited for that. So why don't we jump into the first topic? When, in your opinion, Jack, when should you learn full OLL and PLL? So I would definitely say full PLL comes before full OLL, mainly because there's less algorithms making it easier to learn than full OL because 57 algorithms in full OL, that's a lot to memorize, especially for a newer cuber. But I would say once you know to look OLL and to look PLL, that you can comfortably um, get all your OLL to, and to look and then in PLL, you know, all your corners all permuted, and then you just have your edge PLLs. Once you can comfortably do that, and if you're like, even if you can get sub 20 with that, which that's definitely possible, then I would say start learning full PLL. But even if you just want to jump right into it, after knowing to look PLL, just go for it. Like, why not? It's only going to be, let's see, what do you know? You know, two, a, two U perms, two A perms, H perm and a Z perm. Is that all for to look? Think so. No, and, no, and an E perm. And an yes. E-perm. Yep. So mm-hmm. that's seven. That's seven of them. And that's, that's a third because there's 21. So you already know a third of them. So, and the other ones like a J perm, super easy. You know, both J perms are pretty easy to learn. A T, T perm, super easy to learn. They're all pretty easy algorithms to learn. G perms can be a pain, but I feel like honestly everyone says, oh, G perms are the worst thing in the world. If you just learn a good alg and just learn how to do it, it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, the funny thing is I actually learned opposite from what you just told everybody to do. I got the 57 algorithms. I thought OLLs after F2L, so I should learn that first. So took me a couple months, but I learned like 90% of the OLLs before moving on to full PLL. So I mean, your, your reasoning isn't bad. I, that makes sense. You might as well say, well, I'll move on. I'll, so now I'll learn full OLL, then full PLL. That makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was mainly just because of lack of information. I was just found these algs. Algs, I thought, should make me faster, so I should learn these. And it it didn't look like too much of a challenge because most of the OLLs are 10 moves, maybe a couple more. Yeah, probably about that on average, yeah. Yeah, and then a lot are just um, triggers, so 
I mean, it didn't look like too much of a challenge, but once I got all the basic ones out of the way, it was, it did get more difficult. So, For sure, yeah. When, what is your opinion on, like, what should you be averaging before you move into full? Let's start with PLL. Honestly, I think that you should be able to jump right into it. Once, like I said, once you're comfortable with two look, like if you can easily do two look and your recognition is fast enough, that obviously if you're sitting there AUFing for 20 seconds trying to figure out what case it is, it's probably not best us to go and learn them all. I mean, you can, but I, the funny thing is, I'm not really an expert here. I average just under sub 15, so it's like a, I'm not like I'm like Felix or something. But that's what I would say. I mean. I think it depends for the cuber. Obviously, if your TPS is really good, but your look ahead is bad, you might be able to get 20 second solves because your TPS is that good. Or if your TPS isn't that great, but your look ahead's good and that you could recognize the case in a few seconds, you might be able to say at 25 or 30 seconds, say, I'll start learning PLLs. I'm trying to think for me, I, I want to say I started learning like PLL. I was averaging like 24 or 25 seconds. I, I'm going to guess. I don't know for sure, but that's what I'm going to guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and definitely make sure you know full intuitive F2L before yes. you move into any full algorithm learning because you really need to drill in on your F2L because that's the majority of your solve and that's oh, usually what slows people down the most. Even yeah, that's though number they one. might not want to think it is. So yeah, like <laughs> go ahead. I would say just F2L is one of those things that, you know, I average, we say a 15 second solve, 10 seconds of that is going to be cross an F2L for me. And then depending on, well, or more, depending on my last layer, if I have a really sucky last layer, that's like uh, kind of a G perm that I'm not that great at, or, and like a kind of a, a dot OLL or whatever, that's going to be long, uh, maybe five seconds to do that. But if I have like something like a super easy, you know, two look OLO case and like a T perm, that's going to be like two, two, three seconds maybe. And so if I have to say 15 seconds, 12 seconds of that, then it's F2L and cross, which I would put cross is like maybe two seconds. So 10 seconds of F2L, that's over half the solve is in just F2L. That's super important to be able to know that before being in the last layer. Because last layer is so fast, F2L takes much more practice and time. But then there's also the side of learning algorithms along with improving your F2L. So it's when you're between 50 and 30 seconds, your improvement is so quick if you're consistent, consistently practicing. Like every week, I mean... Drop in two seconds is. Do you think that's a little too much? I I like. I mean, this was a while ago, but when I averaged that, it was like so nice to see at least two seconds of improvement every week after consistent practice. Well, when you're averaging thirty, if you say like fifty seconds under a minute, that improvement happens really fast. That you say I can, I got a new PB by three or four seconds. That yes. when you're sub fifteen. You get you get a new PB by maybe it's twelve point three one is your average, and then you get a I mean, uh, well you say your PB average of five, and then you get a twelve oh five. You know you, you three tenths of a second, and you're like yes I got a new PB average of five. It's like well it was only three tenths of a second. Obviously it's still faster, but even a single you're getting a one second faster single and sub fifteen actually it's kind of a bigger jump, especially sub ten too. Yep. Mm hmm. So I guess I should move into my opinion. I think you should learn full PLL first when you're averaging between 30 and 40 seconds and sure. then move right into full OLL as soon as possible and as soon as you feel comfortable. But right when you're around 30 seconds, start learning that so you get good at the algorithms and so you don't really have to think about that after you get faster and there's always stuff in your after well you can work on always stuff there so 
And, and the cool thing about starting earlier to like that like you said 30 to 40 seconds is that as you do those cases more and more, at least for me, I can oftentimes I know what my AUF is going, going to be because I've done it so many times. Like, like if I have it by a JB perm, if my left side L is all lining up, I know for an AUF I have to do a U prime. I just know that. And so and I'm sure a lot of people know that you probably know that, know that as well. And so like having those that mentality of you know as I as I'm doing these cases and learning them, knowing the AUF so you can just practice that case and go right into your AUF without having to look and stop. Now, oftentimes I kind of blank. I'm like, oh, I had an AUF. I didn't realize that. But a lot, if I'm paying attention, I oftentimes know what my AUF is going to be. Exactly. Yeah. So, and if you wait until you're 20 seconds, sub 20, I mean like 15 seconds, you won't get all that experience of, doing the AUFs like Jack was just talking about and you'll it'll take you longer to get good at the last layer instead of doing the last layer every time you practice after well for sure and one other thing I do want to say is learning good algorithms is important as well just you know if you learn bad algorithms which I'll admit my gperm algs aren't great which I should change them but which ones do you use is uh, it the, well, um, I use for for the wide, the wide ones with the wide use. Yep. Uh huh. I think the, the Alex themselves, I think, are fine, but the problem is that, well, mainly for G A and G B, those are the ones I use uh, the wide use for. The other ones I do it's a, a different ones, which those ones are fine, I think. But the problem is my execution of them isn't great. I yep. struggle to execute them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it just can be hard doing R two and then wide U. Yeah, it's the hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Then rotating the cue ball while doing that. I mean, you can get fast at them, but it's pretty awkward to do with your hands. It is. Anything else about OLL or PLL? Yeah, honestly, I think that learning the best algs right from the beginning is the best way, even though it's tempting to really learn an easier alg because it's easy to think, well, once I know how to do it, I can learn a better alg. Probably just put the you should probably just put the time into learning a one good alg instead of two mediocre algs or one mediocre one good one. And also, I think the cool thing is that um, that when you know your AUFs, like I was saying earlier, is that it helps you um, to just kind of just go right into it, so you don't have the AUF because when you AUF at the end of a solve, and there are times that I have a U two, whatever. I'm like, uh, what do I do? Like, I should know. I should know this. I should be able to just do a straight into a U two. And that's just, I think that's the one of the biggest tips I would say when you learn full PLL, try to just remember where colors are like corresponding to their adjacent side. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Where do you recommend getting good algorithms? Honestly, AlgDB is a great resource. Even Felix has his Cube Skills website, which has good algs. And also, like Chris Olson has his, uh, his like how to perform the R perm like a pro or J perm like a pro or T perm like a pro. And a lot of times he has really the, probably the best algs there, but those are older videos too. So maybe there's a better alg that's come up, which I guess I don't think that's happened, but it's possible, I suppose. But honestly, like alg DB, it's cool because they actually show like the people who are registered who say they use this specific alg. So you can say like, Oh, 385 users use this T perm. And you could say, and then you see the next one is five users. So you say everyone uses that T perm. So I'm going to use that T perm. Whereas there's other algs like like a JA perm, people typically do the the um is it, I think it's R wait is it R U L or or I think it's R prime U L prime L, yeah yeah it's, p- people typically use that one I actually don't use that one I used one that uh, Lucas Etter had a video on like a few years ago it's actually really cool you kind of it's, it takes some wide R moves but it's really cool. And it's actually pretty fast too, because I've always found the R U L thing kind of awkward. It's like it just seems weird transitioning to using your left hand, especially yes. for someone who doesn't use their left hand. So it's a really great uh, video. It's long, just like, I think it's called like a really cool J perm or something like that. But I love that alg. It's a great alg. And like another thing, V perms. V perms are terrible. I hate V perms, and I can't find a good alg for it. I hate the rotation one, but that's the one everyone says to use. So I'm going to use it. But the cool thing is there are people who have posted algs on algdb that maybe actually can be really good. You're like, wow, that's actually a nice alg for that. No one uses this. So I would say algdb is a great resource. Cool. Yeah. I'll definitely have links to all the resources Jack mentioned in the show notes. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up our discussion 
about full OLL and full PLL. Let's move right along to the next topic, and that is, are flagship cubes worth it? Now, this came up in one of the recent episodes. What? Let's run through quickly what the flagship cubes are of each of the major companies. So, you have the GAN 356X, then the Moyu Weilong GTS 3M, and also the um, Weilong WRM. Then, Jack, why don't you take the next two or three? I actually want to add to the Moyu. The GTS 2M is also still really, really popular. Just to say, the GTS 2 people like a lot still. Um, I would say uh, Chi Yi has the Volk 3 uh, M and the Volk 3 Power M. Uh, YJ has the, their MGC. Um, Yushin has, I guess, their Huang Long. Uh, yeah. Who else? Uh-huh. Who else? Might, who, uh, I feel like I'm missing. Well, I guess you have Mofeng Jiaoshi, the MF3 RS 3M. No, I, I'm sorry. That's a budget cube. Never mind. We'll talk about that cube later. Mm-hmm. Take yeah. Care. So, as of right now, there are lots of great cubes to choose from, and these flagship cubes range from thirty dollars up to sixty dollars, and even more if you get them set up in the premium way. So, is it worth it to get these, Jack? What's your opinion? No, and the reason why is because there are so many stinking good budget cubes out here. Like the MF3 RS 3M, I got that a few weeks ago. I thought it was fantastic. Like, is it my main? No. My actually my Volk 3M, my Cosmic Volk 3M is, and that is an expensive cube. I guess it's a flagship, but it's also two years old. To be honest, it's actually the three almost three years old now. But like even like the YJ Yulong B2M, I got from Speed Cube Shop. Like. Uh, I was like, I think it's like 10 bucks, and it's like really good. Same with the MGC, $15 from YJ, which I guess we said that is a flagship, but it's at a budget cube cost. Like I would say budget cube probably is like $15. I would say after that, it's not really budget. I feel like you're kind of in a gray area. But like the Yushin Keelan V2M, 10 bucks, super, super solid cube. Even the Little Magic, super solid cube. I just, I hate it. I hate saying that like, saying this right what i'm going to say right now people i'm probably gonna get a lot of hate for the gan 356x is not that great of a puzzle like honestly i expected way more out of it and maybe that's just it and maybe i don't have it set up right but i average awful on that puzzle i can average better on a 10 dollar cube than a 60 dollar cube i'm not like a sub 10 average solver but still i cannot get good times on it for the life of me i don't know why i just can't Wow. Is size maybe a factor or it's the same size as all my other three by threes, like but the Volk is a fifty five and a half and it's fifty six. Mm-hmm. I don't really notice that big of a difference. Like I could say, Oh, it is a little bigger, but it doesn't affect my solving. Yep. The three fifty four M definitely would affect it and I have that cube because that is two millimeters smaller. So that is a little smaller. Okay. What are some of the recent budget cubes that you've tried out i know it's amazing now when i'm going through the recent releases and i see these magnetic three by threes for under ten dollars i've tried the use under a year ago you didn't see this at all so no this is amazing so like the yj ulong v2m 799 on the cubicle 799 yeah um the MF3 S 3M is, I think, is that 15 or is that 10? It is 12. And the non-magnetic version is 10. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah, so I'm talking about the magnetic version. So $12 for the MF3 S 3M. And even the MF3 S 2 is $8 non-magnetized, which that cube by itself is pretty darn solid. Um, the Yushin Kila V2M is 10 bucks, Super solid as well. MG, uh, MGC, um, the Little Magic is $5, which that's a little bit older cube at this point, but it's still pretty good. It's not a main. I would say that cube is a little bit overhyped. I was expecting more out of it for 5 bucks, but 
I guess what can you expect for five bucks, to be honest? Yeah. But mm-hmm. still, like I've tried I just named a few cubes that were in recent now that I can average on. Like another cube, well I guess it's is it I think it's twenty dollars. It's the Shang Shao Feng one V two M M. That cube actually got very much impressed me for twenty bucks. Just because that uh I wasn't expecting I, from Shang Shao was like it's probably isn't gonna be that good. Actually it was really good. So I don't – that's 20 bucks. That's not really a budget cube, but just to figure I'd throw that in there as well. Yeah. What's – from all the recent magnetic budget cubes you've tried, let's say someone's listening and they want to get a magnetic cube but don't want to spend 30 40 $50 on a 3x3, three three, what magnetic budget cube would you recommend? Well, I guess it dip, it's a budget if we say – I guess what's the line? Where's budget cube? Where's budget cube in? Fifteen dollars, under fifteen, under fifteen. Um, well, I the options I would throw are the MGC, um, the M S three S three M, and the uh, Keelan V two M, and potentially the Ulong V two M. Of those, I would I would say pick pick the M S three S three M or the MGC. The MGC wasn't liked by a lot of people. I happen to really like that cube, although mine's kind of wearing out a little bit. But I personally thought that cube was really good. But the MF3S 3M is more of a mainstream like cube that everyone kind of likes. Well, I think everyone likes. I, I guess I don't know everyone's opinions on it. But that it's more of a typical feeling puzzle, whereas the MGC definitely has a unique feel. I happen to like that unique feel, but not everyone might. I'm sorry, everyone might not. So I would say I would recommend the MF3S 3M. That would be my number one pick probably, say, under 15 bucks. This cube, really solid. You know, I can average easily my times on it, and it works really well. It's not too bad out of the box either. It's a little dry, but you expect that. Yeah. Does that cube come really tight? Because I know the MF MF um two RS. Or no, it's MF three RS. Um, just the original version. They always came super tight in the box, and you would have to like unscrew it at least two whole screw turns on each side to just get it workable. Let me check out my YouTube video here. Let me just, to be perfectly honest, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm trying to remember now. Tensions actually, when I looked at it, they look actually fairly loose. Okay. So maybe they changed that up with that one in the production. Yeah. Or maybe, well, at least look, it was definitely on the medium loose. Like it wasn't like super loose, but it wasn't super tight. It was medium, yeah. medium loose kind of like, yeah, you got that. Have you opened up any of these budget magnetic cubes and looked at the quality of the gluing job and magnets and stuff like that? I have not. I don't really take cubes apart. Like, honestly, I have not set up any of those cubes. I've only just put some cosmic lube in them. And I guess it's a testament to show how good they can be with just some cosmic lube. But cosmic, I'm, don't get me wrong, speak cube shop cosmic lube is super great. I love it. It's awesome stuff. But... Um, really the fact that I can just put like four or five drops of lube in it and immediately they feel really nice. That's really cool. And yeah, I haven't taken the cubes apart, but I assume they're pretty good. I've had any problems with them. So no problems with magnets falling off or anything like that. Not that I know of. And I I guess I don't know if I would know, but I don't think so. I haven't heard anything weird. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, I guess no, actually come to think of it. They're actually probably molded in there. Probably, yeah. Yeah, so disregard the stuff about glue. (laughs) I'm not totally sure, but I'm guessing I'm guessing that. Yeah, honestly. Budget cubes are just so great. Like there's a reason why that world class cubers like Max Park, Felix Zemdegs, um like you say, Luke Setter, Chris Olson, all these people, Patrick Ponce, don't use budget cubes. And that's just because they don't have quite the level of performance. But the amount of cubers that are at that level is very minimal. So there's no reason for all these people, these cubers. I'm not saying that cubers cannot have expensive flagships, but when you have a cuber who averages 16 seconds, there's no reason for them to have a $16 puzzle when they can get the job done. I mean, not 16, a $60 puzzle when they can have like a $15 puzzle or $20 puzzle that can let them do the exact same thing. What about branching off of three by threes what's the line where you should just get the best puzzle you mean like speed wise like where you average um 
or just like quality of the cheapo cubes like with six by six or seven by seven to be honest, I'm I am not well versed in those events, so I can't give a really great opinion on it. To be really honest, I three by three is my main event. I don't even know how to, I've never even solved a six by six or seven by seven, so Yeah, I'm just trying just from what I've seen. I mean, if you're getting into those events and you're planning on getting at least decent in them, in my opinion it's probably worth it to jump right into a better cube because I mean you can learn how to solve a 6x6 six six or 7x7 seven seven on a budget cube but you've already invested almost half of what it's worth what a you know, flagship cube is worth in one of those puzzles so if you're serious about the event I recommend just getting a flagship one so we, if we just go to seven by seven, is the hey seven is the the top seven by seven, correct? No, well, it, it used was. to be, <laughs> but now it's, I mean, it's still up there, but it's the um spark is definitely oh, okay. out beating it. So how much is the, how much does the spark retail for? It's about sixty dollars. What's a budget seven by seven? Like a a decent like a budget a decent budget one like that people could actually use all right for a little while well, the chi yi budget one is 16 mo feng jiao shi mf7 is night or 20 so for 20 bucks so you're, it's a third of the money so i mean you're right that is a a good chunk of money however like you said if you plan on saying i want to be good at seven by seven you should just go for it and just say i'm gonna buy the hey seven or the yushin is it yushin spark no it's it the x man Oh, X Man, that's right. X Man, yep. I'm sorry. X-Man, you should haze seven by seven. So you should. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, I yeah, got you, got you, got you. But buy either one of those seven by sevens, and uh, just go for it from there. But of course, it's one of those things also that you might buy that and you actually might not like it. So I think there's kind of a, a two way street there you have to kind of address that. If you've used a seven by seven and you like it, and you've tried someone else's and you like it. And you, and you want to get good at it, then I would say definitely go for it. But if you just say, I just want to see if I like it, I would definitely don't buy an expensive one, like you said. But if someone wants to get good at it, then I, yeah, you should buy it. Just go for the best one. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe bringing up Big Cubes wasn't the best example. I guess com- coming up with Pyraminx or Skube, going, I recommend just going straight for the concave um, X-Man wingy skew or the X-Man pyraminx. Although, recently, have you tried the, was it Hong Long magnetic pyraminx? That's oh, the that, new that, one, right? Is that, is that Yushin's? The, the Yushin one, yeah. No, I haven't. I'm not a big pyraminx fan. I have an, I have an X-Man Bell M. I have one, but I just never got into pyraminx. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So have, I'm, I'm have you seen anything I, I, about the? Maybe I think I might have seen someone on Instagram about it. Maybe, but it's mm-hmm. hard to say. A lot of times, if I see a pyramid, I'll scroll right past it. I'm like, I don't do pyramids. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. But I mean, that one. I mean, it's not a budget pyramid, but it's definitely another option. But I still, I recommend if it's. If it's within a couple dollars, just get the better one. And Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just... especially. Well, I guess my views, to be honest, cubes weren't like this about a year ago. Yeah, well, what, what were the budget cubes a year ago? Was the MF3 or S2 out a year ago? They, I think it was. Yes, it was. But the budget cubes... And there wasn't the variety... Of budget cubes like there is now and you no. a lot of the budget cubes were outdated and just didn't perform at all like the flagship cubes and I mean, the fact that you could the fact that top cubers can get good times on budget cubes shows how good they are like i look at damien bias the cubologist how for a while he was banning the mf3 or s2m like that's an eight dollar cube with magnets in it and I mean, he's not like the picture perfect um, cuber, like he's not super duper fast or anything. He is fast enough, but the fact that he was manning it 
That was his main. That wasn't like he liked the cube and thought it was a good cube. He's like, this is my favorite cube I have. I wanted this to be my main. Yeah, and it was just it was really just over the past six months or so that Yushin, Moyu, and Chi started coming out with these decent or really good budget options. So it's well, really thing, nice to see and great for the community. Well, I think YJ might have been like the first to actually offer a budget magnetic cube because they had the MGC back. They announced it. Well, Speed Cube Shop teased it like last February or March or whatever. And it finally came in like June. Was that the first one that had but like budget cube that had like magnets? I, I think it was, yeah. And obviously then you have the MF3S uh, 3M, uh, Ulong V2M, Keelan V2M. All these cubes have magnets and they're like less than $15, which is super cool. Like, no, isn't this the Shangsha Mr. M? That's like 10 bucks too, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I right right the, around the $10, $15 range. I haven't tried that, but I've heard it's really good as well. This is Josh jumping in here in post-production where Jack and I were just trying to figure out if there was any more information we could share, and he brought up this topic. I will actually say just one thing, and this doesn't necessarily have to be for the podcast, but when you were talking about how you, you, you might as well just go for the be- better one in general, I'm a, I am love photography, and I've heard people say that tripods, they can be very expensive. You can easily spend like 500 to to $1,000 on just the legs of a tripod, no tripod head. Because it's high quality, uh-huh. you can also you can also buy you know a, a whole tripod set with the head and legs for twenty five dollars from Target or Walmart or wherever. And I've heard it said that you, that you might as well just go for the big one because by the time you invest, like I, I you know I got one of those sets a long time ago, and then I got like the set I, the current one I have now that was like about a hundred like seventy to hundred dollars with um, the tripod and the head, so it was a higher quality tripod, but not quite as high quality as like something you get for hundreds of dollars well i kind of want to buy it you know two or three hundred dollar uh set of tri- a tripod set of tripod that doesn't make any sense a two or a three hundred dollar uh tripod because it's that much higher quality but by the time that if i if i said okay i have to buy 150 dollar now then i'll buy 250 by the time you add all that up and buy the top of the line you spent that m- money already just trying to get there so if you would have saved that money you could just had the top of the line right then you know what i mean exactly yeah but then I guess there's also, you got to, like, I guess you were saying about the 7x7, seven seven, you got to kind of grow into it. Absolutely, and you yeah. you wouldn't be at the place you were unless you invested when you were newer in the sport. Exactly. I'm here in post-production again, and I just thought that anecdote was a good piece of information to share on the podcast, so let's get back to flagship and budget cubes. Actually, one thing I should mention about flagship cubes. Flagships are really good and have their place. My main's a flagship for a reason. I like it better than my budget cubes. But like a GTS 3M or GTS 2M or even an SM for that matter, which I wasn't a big fan to start, but I like it better now. Those cubes, they're good. I mean, and there's a reason why that the GTS 2M was one of the most popular cubes because it is a super solid cube. And actually, for $25, factory magnetized is actually really affordable too. But those cubes are popular because they just give competitors that much better of an edge. Like, they're more polished and more refined. Whereas the budget cubes is like, well, for $15, we can't quite sell it for that cheap and give this level of performance. Which for not only because maybe it's impossible for them to make a profit at that point, but also because and the, they would be making their top of flagships not sellable. Because if the MF3 or S3M sold, uh, performed identical to the uh, GTS3 for twenty dollars less, no one would buy the GTS3. So there has to be a reason why to get the bigger ones because they the bigger the more expensive better ones because they are just a little bit better. Which especially for top cubers they need that. Yeah, well, I think that really covers a lot of aspects in that topic as well. And I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Jack, why don't you tell us about your YouTube channel? Oh, gosh. My YouTube channel is JCB Short Films. I actually just passed 2,000 subscribers like... uh must have been like three weeks ago or so. So I think last time I was on the podcast, I must have had like... 
two or three hundred, maybe. I think so it was, that was also, you had just passed five hundred. Just past five hundred. Okay, you were so, right around there. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So I well, just yeah. 2, congratulations 000. on two K. Oh, thanks. It's not a big deal. I have not been uploading very much lately, to be honest. I've been really busy with my jobs, and I haven't had as much motivation to make cubing videos. I should actually just release a video yesterday on two cube shop cosmic lube, which we did talk about earlier. That stuff is really good. Just kind of a uh, blanket statement. That stuff's really good, and I definitely recommend it. But um, yeah, JCB short films. Check it out. It has a blue the my uh, thumbnail. Not thumbnail. My <laughs> channel logo is a uh, blue circle kind of thing with a camera with a microphone attached to it. So it's a weird name for a human channel, but that's my human channel, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Well, Jack, thanks for coming on this episode of Cube Chats, and hope you join us again sometime. Well, thank you, Josh, for having me. I had a good time, so hopefully I can be here soon. I just need to be invited first. Well, I think that was a very educational conversation. And that was fun talking with Jack. We'll have more Cuba Chats episodes coming up in the next few episodes, as well as in-depth interviews. I've got some great ones lined up, so stay tuned for that. And if, again, if you have any feedback, please email in josh at thecornercutterpodcast.com and, or just comment if you're listening on YouTube. Let me know what podcast app or directory or whatever, where do you listen to the podcast? I want to know, so... Send that in, josh at thecornercutterpodcast.com. Also, I recently ordered some new podcast cards. So if you would just if you just want a few or if you want a bunch to pass out at one of your next competitions, just send me an email with your mailing address and I'll send some right out to you. They look pretty cool. So yeah, just let me know. So I think that pretty much wraps up episode 78. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you taking the time every week to listen to this podcast. And I think it's time to wrap this episode up and take it back to the scrambling table. And I'll talk to you guys again next week in episode 79 of the Corner Cutto Podcast. You really need to drill on... You really need to drill in... in you really need to <laughs> adjacent side. So if you see blues in front of you, uh, just, just say your the red side's in front of you. I don't know how to explain this. <laughs> well, I guess you can edit that part out. But um, basically, just you know, if you know which colors go where, like if you have red on one side and it goes on the back, then you know you have to do U or whatever. Does that make sense? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it'd be easier if I had a cube to show like to actually show people but that's yeah, why just learning... video is good <laughs> <laughs> but yeah AUF learning your AUF is pretty important I, I would say